Well, as you can see, I'm wearing my lovely tropical Hawaiian shirt and it's the last day of March and we are all locked in and not a lot to do, but I thought that I should give you a little talk about indoor bonsai. Indoor bonsai is a subject that bonsai purists don't often like to talk about and they don't like to talk about it quite justifiably because most bonsai or in fact all bonsai are actually grown outdoors. I remember when I first started doing bonsai seriously and that was in 1974-75 when I joined the British Bonsai Association and in club circles bonsai was just outdoor bonsai. If you refer to indoor bonsai that was a dirty word. You never mentioned the word indoor bonsai because all bonsai was considered to be outdoors and justifiably so because tropical plants which are grown in the west as indoor bonsai in the tropics they are grown outdoors. Many of you will have come across my books and in the books I often give you the history of how indoor bonsai started. Indoor bonsai is really an invention of the western world. In the 50s and 60s after the Second World War, when things were recovering and people wanted to beautify their homes, there was a trend to grow indoor plants. And indoor plants were really tropical plants, which because they can't stand the cold and the frost outdoors, they could be grown indoors. But indoor plants do not grow successfully indoors because in the tropics, in their native habitat, they grow in hot uh, humidity, bright sunshine, and you have all the conditions of the tropics which make these plants thrive. So when you try to grow a plant indoors, they are never successful. This is the same about the so-called indoor bonsai. Although the bulk of people who come into bonsai come via the indoor bonsai route, I often tell them that this is not really the bonsai that you should be growing. And I have never been a very good salesman. If I was a good salesman, my business would have expanded and I would be a mega millionaire. But because I was a purist, I always tried to people stay, keep people away from the so-called indoor bonsai and just grow the outdoor bonsai. And of course, the market for the outdoor bonsai is much more limited than indoor bonsai because most people hanker after growing a plant indoors. Whenever I have a, nurse, uh, a nursery customer come uh, to see us, the first thing they ask is, where are all the indoor bonsai? And they are a bit disappointed when I show them all the beautiful outdoor bonsai and the indoor bonsai are rather drab. I'm standing in front of a beautiful loropetalum, which is red. There are very few bonsai that are in fact actually red. They are all just a plain green colour. So let me say something about indoor bonsai and how you can grow them successfully. When you look at the environment that I'm standing in, which is our indoor greenhouse, this is where we sell our indoor plants. This is not really a typical Western living room where the temperatures are about 20 to 25 or even 28 degrees centigrade, uh, which in uh, the old money is like mid 50s to the 70s Fahrenheit. And it's very warm and dry. The environment in this greenhouse is, in the winter it goes down to freezing, and in the daytime when the sun is shining bright, it can rise to about 15 or 20 degrees. In the summertime, of course, it gets as high as the mid 30s and even 40 degrees centigrade, which is very, very warm. And then we open all the doors. Today, on the 31st of March, the ambient temperature in here is, I think about 15 to 16 degrees centigrade. And tonight it will probably go down to three degrees. And of course I keep watering the plants. So there's always very high humidity. So the environment here is not like the environment you would get in a typical living room. And therefore, the indoor bonsai always tend to suffer. There is no two ways about it. But having said that, you can still grow them successfully. 
If you grow them in a heated conservatory in the winter, where you can provide the conditions very similar to this greenhouse, you will see that they will grow much better. I have had some customers, some dear old uh, uh, ladies who have been coming to us for the last 20 or more years, and they grow them successfully in their unheated greenhouse or in the conservatory, and they have had Chinese ems, which they've had for about 20 or more years, and they're ever so healthy and strong. So it is possible to grow indoor bonsai successfully. What I will now do uh, is to go around and describe all the different varieties of uh, the more popular indoor bonsai that are on the market. So let me take you for a little tour around our indoor greenhouse and my conservatory to show you what can be grown. By far the most popular variety of so-called indoor bonsai that is sold on the uh, market, the Western market, is the Chinese elm. The Chinese elm is an elm. And although in Europe they refer to it as Zelkova parviflora, that is in fact the wrong name. Zelkova is the name given to the Japanese grey bark elm and the true Zelkova is Zelkova serrata. In Japan, it is grown mainly as a broom style bonsai and it's very popular as a street tree or amenity tree. So when they call it Zelkova parviflora, this is the wrong name. I won't go into the politics of why this was called Zelkova, but suffice it to say is that the elm was regarded as a dangerous species because there, there was Dutch elm disease in the mid 60s and early 70s when all the elms throughout Europe were decimated by the Dutch elm disease. So people are afraid of elm, so they don't call it elm, the Chinese elm is not called an elm and they call it Zelkova, but it is a true elm. I would just say in passing that there are many types of elm. There's the rough bark elm that comes from Japan which has corky bark and the Chinese elm which is produced in China they have the smooth bark and they have these leaves. If they are fertilized well they will have this lovely deep green color. Some of my elms here are only just coming into leaf so they have these fresh green leaves and they're really healthy and strong. All these leaves which are about four inches long the stems are all this year's growth and this greenhouse is not heated so it just gets the sunlight to keep it warm. I have also other elms which I grow outdoors and in case you're wondering why you can grow the elm outdoors all I would say is that the elm is a very very hardy species now I'm going to show you two really, really big old elms. They are just coming into leaf. They've only come into leaf in the last two weeks. This has a trunk of about five to six inches in diameter, gnarled and old. So is this one. And these are all the new leaves that have started emerging from the tree. So they lose all the leaves in winter because I keep it outdoors and it goes through the uh, process of uh, shedding leaves in the autumn and they get the new leaves in spring. So the elm is one of those few species that can be grown both indoors or outdoors. If you grow them outdoors they grow much better because you treat them like a normal bonsai but if you grow them indoors you must keep it in a very very cool environment. So the success of the Chinese elm depends largely on the temperature in which you grow it in. So if you grow it in a cool room with a lot of light and make sure the soil never dries out, that is okay. Sometimes people say, oh, my elm has got yellow leaves in the spring and summer. This is perfectly normal because when you get the new leaves, the old leaves will drop. So don't worry about that. The elms are also susceptible to disease so mainly the uh, aphids and sometimes you get a white fly if you see that you either jet it off with a jet of water or you spray insecticide and you will 
soon get rid of it. Don't worry about the leaves, some being big, big and some small. Look at these two elms side by side. That elm has got very small leaves. That may be a slightly different species, while this one has got big leaves. So, so much about the elm. So the secret to growing them successfully indoors is to keep them in a cool room with lots of light and they grow better if they're grown outdoors. Then the next most common plant that is grown as indoor bonsai is the sagaretia. The sagaretia is the tree that appears in my first book, Bonsai, the Art of Growing and Keeping Miniature Trees. That was probably the first ever sagaretia imported into Europe and that was imported by Tokonoma Bonsai uh, and it was in the Chinese exhibition at Chelsea in 1980. So that is a lovely tree and um, it's a favorite tree of mine. Unfortunately, it didn't survive. It died only a few years ago. Uh, and the young leaves of Sagaretia are this lovely pinky color. So all the sagretta have these new leaves that are this lovely color. And of course, they shed the old leaves as the new leaves emerge. Sagretia is sometimes referred to as bird plum cherry because the Chinese or the Cantonese word for sagretia is chok mui. Chok means uh, bird and mui is the plum or the plum blossom. So chok mui means the plum blossom, which the birds are very fond of uh, hosting on. So much for sagaretia. Sometimes you get very large specimens, but on the whole, most of the sagaretias tend to have small trunks which are sold commercially. We don't have very many big ones now. I used to have them. So sagaretia is the next common one. I will show you another example. So these are all sagretia. This is what we call the broom style. All the new tips of the leaves. And sometimes they're trained in the S shape with the curly shape. So much for the sagretia. The next variety I'm going to talk about is what we call the pepper tree. Sometimes people refer to it as Sichuan pepper. I've heard it referred to as Japan pepper. But the botanical name is uh, Xanthoxylum piperitum. So you need to check this in the encyclopedia. And they have these compound leaves and Apparently, these leaves have an aromatic smell and I believe that it is used for garnishing and can be used as a salad. It's got a lovely smell like lemon or lime leaves and they have tiny little flowers in the summer, very insignificant crimson type flowers which are hardly noticeable. But in this uh, continent in Europe, they seldom uh, produce the seeds or the peppercorns because we don't have warm temperatures or temperatures which are not warm enough for them to produce seed. So, so that is so much for the pepper tree. The next variety I want to talk about is the Chinese privet. Privet is lugustrum, so I'm not sure if the exact botanical species is just called lugustrum sinensis or whatever, but it's certainly not the one that is grown as hedging plants in Europe. But you can see that the leaves are definitely a privet type leaf. There are two varieties, the only green variety and the variegated variety. So that one is simply called lugustrum variegata, uh, again in the West we grow them as a golden form, not so white as this. And again, that is used for hedging. And the very popular shape are these S shapes. They do lose some of the leaves in winter, so you've got to be careful. By the way, 
Don't be worried when indoor bonsai lose their leaves. Look at that, these are the pepper leaves, pepper tree leaves that have fallen. So when you get leaf drop in the spring and also in the autumn, this is quite common. So do not panic when you see leaves falling off the trees. It's perfectly natural for it to do that. So this is ligustrum. This is a ligustrum forest that one of our staff have made. So you can plant several together to make a forest. So, so much for ligustrum. Now, let me turn to podocarpus because while I'm here, this is a podocarpus forest. Again, one of my colleagues have made. Podocarpus is sometimes referred to as the Buddha pine. This one has got the large needles or the large leaves. There are two varieties. I will show you another one with the large leaves. This one is the large leaf podocarpus. So is this. But there are other varieties that have much smaller leaves. In Japan, it's called maki, I think. And the Chinese are very fond of it. And most of the trees now that are grown in Japan are in fact exported to China because the Chinese absolutely love podocarpus. It's supposed to be a very lucky tree. That tree is every bit four to five foot tall. Look at it in the greenhouse. Uh, I buy it because they're just nice, but the chances of selling it for someone to grow in the living room are very slim because who would have a large living room to accommodate that tree? Maybe a bank or an architect's office might have it. Now let me turn to some of these smaller ones. Many of them are grown in these very informal shapes. Some of them have got the S shape. So there are some with which have large needles, some have got small needles. So this is Podocarpus. The new foliage is really nice. See how it contrasts with the old darker foliage. And then I have some really dinky ones, small ones here. This is Podocarpus as well. Now the next variety I can talk about is the um, the next variety that I'm going to show you is the Japanese holly. This, believe it or not, is a, a actual holly and as all hollies, they produced fruit. I've just spotted one that has fruit. If I home and can you see those black berries? This is what the holly berries look like. Little black round fruit. They're not red in color, but it produces holly berries, although they're not red. So Ilex cronata is the name for the Japanese holly and very, very popular. Look at these small ones. They grow ever so easily from cuttings, sometimes grown in an S shape, in form upright shape. And this is the same variety that is often grown as garden trees. You see them as uh, one, one and a half, two meter tall garden trees, which are quite expensive to buy. But I've seen many people grow them in their gardens outside in England and in Europe. If you live in the um, Mediterranean countries, they will survive outdoors. But if you grow them in cool temperate countries like England, Germany, Sweden, they will not survive the winters. So don't be fooled. Do not grow them as an outdoor tree. They will not survive. I've seen many people grow them in their Japanese gardens thinking it will survive like the pine. It does not survive. And the same applies to the podocarpus. If they're grown as large garden trees and you try to grow them outdoors, they will not survive the winter. So the Japanese holly, you've got to be careful. The other popular tree which I will now show you is the Mediterranean types, which include mainly our citrus. Now, there are many types of oranges, citrus. There's this very tiny ones, I think it's called citronella or whatever. And these kumquat, 
beautiful little things. They were just grown for the novelty of the fruit, given a slight twist. So they come from the warm countries of the Mediterranean. So if you grow them indoors, you, again, you've got to give a lot of humidity and make sure that it's not too hot or dry. While I'm passing this little structure, it's a bubble plastic structure. I keep my ficuses in here because I can't afford to heat this large greenhouse. So I just keep the ficuses and the jade trees in here because they can't stand the cold. We also grow these funny sedums. They're just novelty things. And that's a pepper tree while I'm passing, grown in the funny cascade style. All these trees come from China. There's a ficus there, ficus retusa, with all those massive aerial roots. I'll talk about ficus in just a moment. I have just spotted a tree which I don't like selling because it's very, very difficult. This is the Carmona or Fukien tea. Although I have had a few of them in the nursery, I find that they are extremely difficult to keep alive. So, uh, although they are nice and green, and if they're grown properly, they produce uh, little white flowers, I think the botanical name is also Raitia religiosa. But in the West, in, in the UK, Germany, and countries like that, they do not survive well. So. I would not recommend growing the Carmona because it's ever such a difficult variety to grow. As I said, I'm going to talk about ficus in more detail in a minute. While I'm in this part of the nursery, there are lots of these lovely brush cherry. And the brush cherry is a variety that is only uh, recently become more popular. Sometimes I think this is also called Barbados cherry. I'm not sure because I don't know this species so well. But the botanical name is Sisygium microphylla because it has small leaves. They have little white pom-pom like flowers in the summer. And after flowering, they produce little dark crimson, almost deep red berries, which makes it very attractive as a plant. But again, be warned, it is not an easy indoor species to grow. Although the spring growth like this is tipped with little red shoots, they all have these lovely red shoots now, now that spring is coming. You've got to keep it in a very, very cool room and with lots of humidity. If you keep it in a warm room, they will die. A lot of people are not successful with it, and I would put this as one of the more difficult varieties. Difficult in the sense that if you don't give it enough humidity and don't keep it cool, they will struggle to survive. So do be careful of the brush cherry. It is a difficult variety to grow. I'm just trying to see what other varieties there are in this greenhouse before I move on. Uh, I think I've shown you most of the varieties in here. I'm going to talk about the ficuses and the jade trees in just a moment. Oh yes, I should perhaps talk about the Mediterranean varieties and I'll take you to another greenhouse. Now the olive tree is a Mediterranean plant. We have quite a few olives here with beautiful trunks and the olives, we tend to grow them as a semi hardy tree in the sense that we grow them under cover in the winter. That means in an unheated greenhouse. Look at these ones with the massive trunks. We grow them in an unheated greenhouse and you can keep it in a living room, provided it is very cool, but very uh, moist as well. If you keep it in a room which is too hot and dry, the leaves will dry out and they will suffer. 
So these olives here go down to freezing because this greenhouse or this tunnel is not heated. So they survive the winters zero degrees or minus two, minus three. And then in the summer, we bring them out. There are many types of olive. These larger leaves uh, type, they produce fruit. But there is also a very small leaf one, which is called the wild olive. And that doesn't produce fruit so readily. So they are grown sometimes as indoor bonsai, but you've got to be very careful and you've got to keep them uh, in a cool room and don't let it dry out. Another variety which is relatively uh, recent as an introduction to bonsai is this one which is pistachia. Pistachia is a Mediterranean plant and the leaves are aromatic compound leaves and I was reading somewhere in Google that pistachia was used by the Romans like the way you use chewing gum. If you chew the leaves it leaves a nice fragrant smell to the mouth so it must have been used for you know preventing bad breath so this is the history of this plant and it is a mediterranean plant and used for bonsai in the autumn they have nice foliage but again remember you've got to keep it on the dry side so while i'm here a lot of lemon trees here lemon trees are very very hardy very easy to propagate from cuttings and people grow them because they uh, have the lovely scented flowers and fruit also while i'm here the pomegranate again is a mediterranean plant so these are pomegranate nice s shape and because they're a mediterranean plant they have to be kept on the cool side and although it's only the end of march look at them they're already flowering beautiful flower and the buds and all these they all started to flower so they have a very long flowering season right from uh, march till i would say september they can be in flower and they produce lovely fruit this is the miniature variety so they have small flowers and small fruit i think i've shown you this room of ours before this is our Zen meditation center or yoga center. We do Tai Chi. We also dance. And this is where I use my rowing machine. I use it religiously every day. And I show you this room because we keep our ficuses in here, especially the large ones. There are only a few of these large ones left in here because we've repotted about three or four very large ones. So they've been taken to the greenhouse. So they're no longer in here. I brought you in here mainly to show you the jade trees, the jade tree or money tree. This variety with the small leaves is called Portulacaria afra, obviously because it may have come originally from Africa. So this is another one, Portulacaria afra. This is a very large tree. I'm going to work on that in a demonstration one day to transform that tree. When I used to go to India, I used to love working on these trees. They can be wired. I never thought they could be wired, but they can be wired. This is the small leaf jade tree and I call this the lazy person's tree because they don't need a lot of water because being a succulent like a cactus they like dry conditions so you can neglect this tree you may not even water it for one or two weeks at a time in winter and they will survive so they are extremely uh, happy not being watered regularly but I would say they cannot stand frost. In fact, you mustn't let it fall below four or five degrees centigrade. If it goes to freezing, then you could have killed the tree. So be very careful with this tree. They cannot stand 
the frost. So of all the so-called indoor species, I would rate this as the single most uh, easy uh, or the number one lazy person's tree, the jade tree. They are wide and shaped into this S shape. Now that is the small leaf jade. There's also the larger leaf jade, which a lot of people grow as a house plant. And this tree here is about four feet tall. And the trunk diameter at the base is about 12 to 15 inches. There were about five trunks and I broke two or three of them off because they were too heavy and bulky. So they've calloused, you can see and it's got this massive trunk. It was given to me by a dear gentleman who since passed away. He grew it for 45 years and uh, he gave it to me maybe about 20 years ago because he couldn't handle the tree anymore. It was too big and heavy for him. And I've had it ever since. I've made many, many cuttings from that tree. This type of jade is such an easy tree to propagate. If you just let the leaves fall on the ground, they will produce new shoots. Look at this one. This little leaf, you can see the new shoots that are coming from the leaf. That will make a new plant just from the leaf. I remember as a boy when I used to grow plants in India. There are many types of plants in this category of this family. I think mainly they were called bryophyllums and they always send out roots from the fallen leaves. Look at it, that will make a new plant. So very easy to propagate. You just break a little twig. This plant here is a cutting from that tree. So ever so easy to grow. And these are not that easy to wire, not like the small leaf pot Portulacaria. I think that one is called Portulacaria ovata. And this one is Portulacaria afra. Now I've brought you into the conservatory of my home. This conservatory is about, I would say 40 foot long and about, I would say 10 foot wide. And the height at the apex is about 12 feet. So it's a very small, relatively small, volume of space and because I can't afford to heat the large greenhouse which is massive I just heat this little room to keep my ficuses alive in the winter. Ficuses cannot stand uh, cold temperatures. The ideal minimum temperature would be no more than I would say three degrees or even five degrees. Ideally, it should be like 7 to 10 degrees and in the summer it can stand any degree of warmth or heat. I would say the ficus is by far the most reliable indoor bonsai. But again, as with most indoor bonsai, be careful. They are not always evergreen because they can shed the leaves in winter. So like this variety, that's another variety. That's not the reducer. That is more like the Benjamina family. That has shed most of the leaves and it's only getting the new leaves again. So most of the ficuses, although they are evergreen, they do shed some leaves. So be warned. Uh, there are other varieties I will show you, but coming to the ficus, as long as you keep it damp, humid, this is a very humid environment and give it a lot of light. The ficus is by far the easiest of all the indoor varieties. I was telling you about Carmona. I will show you some Carmona that I have here. They are kept in this very warm environment. See, this one lost all the leaves, but the new leaves are coming again. But I would not recommend Carmona. It's ever such a difficult tree to grow. This is Sarissa. Sarissa with the exposed roots, typical Chinese style exposed root bonsai. And they have little white flowers. There's a variety of Sarissa that has variegated leaves and little purple flowers. Sarissa fetida 
Fetida refers to fetus. So it has a very nasty smell. So don't rub the leaves because you won't like the smell of the leaves. The other plants that I haven't shown you is the Bougainvillea. In India and other tropical countries, Bougainvillea is such a beautiful plant. These are flowers that were from last year, but in this country, they're hard to grow, but we still manage to keep them alive. They're Mediterranean plants. Another variety which is difficult is this one is called Cufia. They lose all their leaves. They're getting new leaves again. They're not dead. These plants are not dead, but a very difficult variety to keep. So Cufia is a difficult one. So if you were to ask me which species would you recommend for a beginner, I would say every time the ficus is by far the easiest. And next in line, if you are a lazy person, it would be the jade tree. Um, this one is Duranta. I've just missed it. Duranta is usually a hedging plant in the tropics. Again, a difficult variety. But if you are careful, they will survive. I've just come across this one, which is your uh, lantana. It's got very pungent leaves. Again, an extremely difficult one for Western Europe. They grow well in the tropics if you go, and the, of course, Mediterranean countries. You go to Spain, Italy, Greece, they grow wild as scrub plants in the hedgerows and they literally line the streets wherever you go. So I hope I've covered comprehensively most of the plants and uh, I will now just go back to the other greenhouse and say a little more. Now I often get asked by people, why can't I grow these lovely maples indoors? Can you grow an indoor uh, plant outdoors? Well, the answer to that is yes, you can grow the indoor ones outdoors in the summer, but if it can't stand the frost, you can't grow them outdoors in the winter. But the outdoor trees like the maples, they may survive being kept indoors for two or three months, and then they will begin to look sick and healthy. So the answer is, if you want to grow an outdoor trees uh, inside your living room, be careful. It is not the ideal environment. I'm not just going to say that it'll die instantly, but they will not survive for long. So outdoor trees should be grown outdoors. Don't be tempted to grow it indoors unless you want to try it as an experiment. But I can assure you, it's not that easy to do. I brought you into this greenhouse because I want to show you the edible fig or the ficus carica. Now these are edible figs. These have been grown in a warmer environment. So they've got their leaves coming out first. So these produce these lovely figs. Look at that fig from last year. And all these beautiful little baby figs are starting to grow. So this is sometimes grown indoors, but do be careful. You've got to keep it well watered and they don't like the room being too warm they are really outdoor trees but they can stand some frost but not a lot of frost so i hope i've now covered all the varieties that can be grown uh, either indoors or in a greenhouse but the division between indoor and outdoor is a very fine one because a lot of the Mediterranean plants are neither one thing nor the other. So that can be confusing. I will now end by showing you my book. This was written in 2012, originally called the Bonsai Bible, but I now think the publishers have called it the Bonsai Beginner's Bible. And it's like a mini encyclopedia of all the different species of trees, their likes and dislikes. So this describes uh, both the outdoor varieties and the indoor varieties and a uh, handy little reference book to have. So with that, I hope you've 
enjoyed this little talk and tour of indoor species. I'm sure there are more indoor species that I could have covered, but uh, I can't do everything. But what I've told you, I hope you have found helpful.